Hello and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr, where we talk about the art and culture of running a record label. Today is another Industry Insider episode where instead of talking directly with record labels, we talk with organizations and people in the music industry who help record labels and help musicians do their job. And today we're camping out on the subject of music publishing. My friend Paulina from Three Tone Publishing is our guest today. And we're talking all about publishing. Publishing is such a huge topic for two reasons. One, a lot of artists, a lot of uh, songwriters and independent artists aren't really sure what they're supposed to be doing when it comes to their catalog, their the songs they've written. How do you copyright your songs? Uh, do I need to register for a PRO? Um, how am I collecting all of the royalties that are owed to me? As well as record labels, our core audience, have been thinking about how can we help and guide our artists to make the right decisions when it comes to their publishing. And also that question of, should we as record labels start our own publishing company as a way to bring in uh, alternative revenue streams? So those are the questions that we're gonna tackle today. Now, today, actually, as I record this, we are just launching our new micro courses for record labels. What's that? These are single subject online courses designed specifically for record labels, tackling individual subjects. And in this case, we tackle web design, we tackle social media, and we tackle music publishing specifically for record labels. So you can find out more about those by going to otherrecordlabels.com slash courses. That's otherrecordlabels.com slash courses. And the music publishing course, which is one of the courses we're launching now in the new micro course series, is put together by Paulina, my guest today, and it tackles all of the very um, critical stuff when it comes to copywriting and it comes to being intentional about making sure our artists get paid for their catalog. And so that's what we tackle today and that's what we tackle in the course. Make sure you check out the courses. I'm so excited about what they're gonna do for your label. Go to otherrecordlabels.com slash courses to check those out and enjoy the interview. I'll be honest, we've been working on our music publishing course now for a few months and, and we've talked endlessly about music publishing. It certainly feels that way. But it, it mm -hmm. is still, for me, you know, even being kind of in it for two or three months or four months or however long, it's still a really tricky nut to crack. Like, why is that? What makes it the most confusing part of the music business, in my opinion? So I think the very nature of it is quite peculiar in that it's small amounts of money that comes from different sources. It's immediately difficult to navigate. So, you know, you've got hmm. your it's kind of like penny stocks, you know, it comes in from so many revenues. It's all part of your, it, it kind of touches the law side, but yes. not really because there's no such thing as sort of publishing law. So I suppose the lines aren't defined. There's not a sort of, this is how you do it. Um, I think in addition to that, it's also kind of outdated. So we're looking at it, at, uh, we're looking at it now retrospectively so we're looking back at you know a hundred years of an industry that has you know changed <laughs> to beyond recognition it is you know if you talk to someone in music publishing uh 100 years ago they wouldn't know what the hell you would it'd be like you were a sort of <laughs> rambling fool or something so i think yeah i think it's kind of the difference we're, we're trying to catch up on ourselves and it's, I mean, I think also there's different practices. Everyone is sort of doing slightly different things. There's not a unified um, mm. way of doing things. So, which in a way is kind of a good thing, but it does mean that there puts restrictions on things like, you know, having a singular database. And finally, I think there is an element of this is just how the music industry is. It, it's almost not favorable for people to know everything yeah <laughs> um there's very few professionals uh, industry professionals that will have a full understanding of everything that's true um, because it's impossible it's such a huge topic and you know there's experts in certain fields and you know that's their job so i think 
I think it's the industry thing as well that, you know, it's just too big to grasp and for, for one person to grasp. So you're always going to, no matter how many years you've been in the industry, you're always going to come across something that, you know, a way of doing things that you've just never seen before. That's a really, so you just, yeah. You that, just learn. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a great point and, and also a great introduction to our, our episode and, and these episodes of, <laughs> of Industry Insiders because, mm. you know, we, I, I, once a month, I like to spend an hour with a non record label individual. And, and, and you're so right. I mean, I, I, you know, we're doing 12 or more of these episodes a year and talking for an hour and barely scratching the surface on any given topic in the industry mm -hmm. for one person to know all of that impossible. I mean, I think you're about as close as it'll get. Oh my gosh. <laughs> thank you. Hold on. I'm just going to pull that quote out. Oh, <laughs> that's going on our website. Um, Very good. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny as you were talking about going back a hundred years, you're so right as how this industry, and I, I haven't looked at it this way before. It's always been this reactive industry to, you know, somebody is doing something and, and then a, a songwriter is saying, hey, hold on a second, let me get paid. And and everything is uh, feels like it's always just going backwards and saying, you know, uh, and I think about, you know, as an example, you know, there's the, the, the most common form of distribution in the 1920s uh, music distribution was mm. on paper and at the, at the <laughs> supermarket buying a, a, the uh, your favorite song on paper and hoping that grandma can play it for you in the living room and then you, the real yeah I'm go sorry, ahead no go no on. go, no, go. Was, this is I you i was gonna say the, the real kicker uh, kicker for the 1920s was when the um pianolas were introduced that could right you know the piano that play, play, <laughs> pianos that, that played themselves I player mean, that piano yeah the whole industry <laughs> how, do, how do you license that that's right and and <laughs> so, oh my gosh yeah. and you it's funny it's so easy to laugh about now but <laughs> We have versions of that all the time. I mean, we have uh, computer software uh, algorithms that do mastering and, and, and are trying to put yeah. mastering engineers out of work. But imagine being a piano player saying, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's essentially how the recorded, um, the, the sort of performer side um, that used to, you know, I sort of I talk about this in the course a little bit with the neighboring rights. You know, they used to have to come into the radio station to play the music. Mm. And and that then it would be kind of streamed, broadcast live to yeah. an audience, and they got paid, and they they went home and they fed their families. Whereas you know when the first vinyl showed up and they were no longer needed, that, that's crazy. You, know, that, you have to adapt. The industry had to adapt. And that's the origin of mechanicals. Is that right? Uh, neighboring rights. Okay, but isn't that similar to? Uh, where mechanicals came from because it was a a, me a mechanical machine replaying uh yeah so so i suppose in a way yes so mechanicals came in with um but but that's looking at more of the composite so that's actually closer to the publishing side yes oh okay. which i probably should be talking about not not neighboring <laughs> rights um but yeah so so you know as uh, uh, compositions were being reproduced in a format that you know wasn't heard of before yeah and so it was you know mechanically machine stamped um reproduced um on a mass scale and so for every time it's reproduced you get a royalty from that so that's essentially your um your mechanicals i do remember there was someone that told me and i'm sorry if i'm going off topic no. here, but i remember someone told me a really clear way if you're ever confused about the difference between performance um royalties and mechanical royalties so mechanical royalties are general, and, and I don't, I haven't investigated this fully. Sure. But I thought it was quite a neat introduction into like the difference between them. So mechanical is when you choose to listen to the music. So from the listener's perspective, mm. so you physically have to take a product and you have to play it, and you, you can choose what product you play sure. and when you play it. Performance is when the music is forced upon you. <laughs> so, so it's when you hear it in in pubs, in on radio, on right. TV. You know, it's when you don't take an active role in in in, in selecting what you're listening to. So I thought it was That's, quite a neat way of differentiating between the two. I'm sure it has loopholes. I like that. Yeah, no, I like um, that. But it's quite a fun little sort of thing. <laughs> uh, um, it's funny as we we kind of are teasing our ancestors and making fun of of how they felt about the first phonograph or the or the first player piano. But 
there, there's got to be elements of that in your job today where you're feeling like something new is happening and you have to react quickly to make sure that the, the songwriters are, are being paid. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, streaming is almost becoming outdated now in a way because we've talked about it so much mm. and there's so many sort of books that have been like new editions of books being published that are coming out with sort of, oh, we've got an app updated chapter on streaming. Mm, yeah. And it's almost like, well, you know, great, but <laughs> what's going to be the next thing? That's what we should be looking to. That's right. Um, you know, I think, I'd say that I, it's not so much new formats being invented um, that I'm, my, I'm personally am worried about. It's about, tracking those existing formats and making sure that, you know, there's so many companies out there. I was just talking earlier with someone today um, about um, PRS have teamed up with a company whose name I can't remember. Um, so I don't want to give you the wrong one, um, but they're basically are introducing these or developing these devices that you could that, that basically use Shazam technology, um, audio ID technology sure. that you plug into a venue and it, it's almost like a dictaphone in that it report it records what it identifies the tracks being played. Somehow they say, I mean, there's ethical questions around it in yeah. that, you know, is it recording all our conversations also? And meanwhile, but they do say that they have a way of filtering out background noise. So it just picks up the music uh. and that reports directly to the society. So in essence, um, any pub, any restaurant, any record shop, hairdressers, live music event can stick one of those things in the periphery, sort of the listener's periphery, and and be able to report directly to the society of everything that's being played, Play, so that the artist even live, live, yeah, yes, no, that's yeah, exactly that's right. exactly what wow. it's for. So it's everything, you know, and and. And so, and and yeah, I'm guessing live would come under that. You, you mean like live? Yeah, yeah like not necessarily yeah. like a DJ. You're talking about a band's playing on stage, and they're and they're going to get their. Performance. Well, I think that's the next yes, step. Yeah, right. I don't know yeah. where they are. I haven't yeah. followed up on it recently, but I think that is exactly what they're going to do. And so, but then the question is, can societies, which for the most part are you know only just now getting to a point where they're comfortable in their sort of development in terms of record, reporting digital revenue and catching up with that side of the industry, are they able to handle, you know, masses of data? You can imagine every single venue yeah. that has a license to play music, sending them hours and hours and hours of, well, or I'm imagining it'd be converted into some kind of a user-friendly format, true, but, true, you know, yeah. just sending those heaps of data for someone to process. So, there's, it's a little bit off topic, but you can sort of see that, you know, even with solutions come new problems. Yes. Well, and I mean, I would imagine there wouldn't be a ton of incentive for a pub to, to do that. It would have to be mandated by law. Um, well, I mean, it's, it already, I mean, that actually doesn't really, for the pubs, it doesn't matter um, because, you know, they already have to pay a license to play the music. Okay. They don't pay based on how much they play or oh, from I see. My understanding, as far as I'm concerned, they don't, I, I, I certainly don't know. I think they just pay an annual license fee um, to be able to, for the right to play music in their premises. And then, oh, okay. and then that's what they do. Oh, so, so this they, would they, just they be don't have to do any reporting anyway. So this would just help the societies collect more yeah. accurate data. But you're right. It would, it would, it could cause so much trouble. Like, you know, if, especially if somebody is singing poorly into a microphone <laughs> and it, it, and that gets sent to the wrong artist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But that's yeah. that's cool. So, so you know how we how we audit that data is another question. Yeah. So it, and also, but I think it's just the sheer capacity of societies to protest copious amounts of data is, is going to be the first sort of big challenge. But I, I I'm sure they're figuring it figuring it out. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's it, it, it's so interesting to think like you know in 50 years from now we can be like oh what song did I play that night 30 years ago at that one mm. pub oh here it is <laughs> yeah, absolutely okay darling what's our first, what's our <laughs> yeah. first song <laughs> uh, and then you play back the recording and exactly. he's actually talking to another girl at the pub <laughs> Um, so this is a million dollar question and I feel bad for mm -hmm. blindsiding you but what is music publishing <laughs> um, okay so um, music publishing is the system uh, that collects 
that um okay just it's a neat <laughs> sentence you gosh you did, you did very just, well just one yes, sentence so it's, it's an industry it's it's a part of the industry that represents composers and um uh composition rights holders so publishers um it looks after the composition side of the recording of the of the music industry so that's your basic underlying melody lyrics chords you know that before mm. that it ever gets uh, recorded into a physical kind of product um so there's your composition and what you do with those composition rights is kind of also music publishing so you can produce licenses um you can play the music live and it's just it's just a suppose a system Mm. um through which composers and um writers and artists can get paid yeah that's great how is music publishing different for each country i know a lot of our audience members <laughs> are based in the u.s i'm in canada as mm -hmm. you know you sound based on your voice like you're italian in what ways <laughs> does does this uh business of music publishing differ across the the globe um Slightly, I would say it, <laughs> okay. it differs. It differs slightly, which I think is where the big sort of kind of deeper secrets are hidden. Mm. Um, I, I, I'd say generally the industry is similar throughout. Um, the processes are the same. There's still there's you know the the, the usage of the usages for the music are the same. Um, there will be nuances in terms of. Um, like specific societies, distribution rules, like I've touched in the course about the difference between, for example, STEM um, have a sort of 33, 66% split in favor of the artist, or of the writer. Mm. Um, pretty much, you know, everywhere else outside of those specific countries, it's a 50, 100. So it's a 50, 50 split on performance um, and a 100% to the publisher. For collecting royalties on on mechanicals, sorry, one hundred on mechanicals. Um, so so you get little nuances like that. Um, different country like US has three performance or four performance rights societies. So there's BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, CSAC, SE, SAC, yep, yep. and then I think there's another one. <laughs> there is another one, but oh, I can't remember it. Yeah. Um... It's not Harry Fox, is it? Is that different? No, no, that's the mechanical. Okay. But, but it, there's another. There's a one that's um that's more private, right? That's harder to get into. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that it's it's like cause, yeah. It's for exactly. a certain. I think it's for for a certain genre too. Like it might just be for pop or something. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, I can't you know remember. What? I can. I can probably tell you it. <laughs> um. So the these um in most cases are these um performance rights organizations. Are are they in most cases non for profit? Sodrak, I think is that's the other right. One. Sorry, yeah. No, so no, no. Sodrak is Canada. No, never mind. Sorry, I'll leave okay. that because okay. I will get distracted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. Repeat your question. Okay. Please. Uh, um, so let's talk about the PROs for a second. Are they all non for profit or most of them? Oof, uh, I, again, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah. Are they all non for profit. Um, uh, certainly most aren't. Um, PRS hmm. definitely isn't. Um, oh, okay. I don't know about the American ones. Um, I think they're non-for-profit as well, um, but I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I, I I don't think there's like a okay. mandate oh, okay, for them I to see. be non-profit, but... Um, uh, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. Here's a, an interesting question. I, 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 are any they do collect royalties if that's what you mean? They, they 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 do take a commission. They do take a commission. Okay. But also, also ASCAP is a not for profit, so I imagine it's going to be the same for you for BMI. Right. I mean, from what I understand with SoCan in Canada, it's they obviously take a a, a cut just to pay for their for them yes. to be in existence, but there, there's no shareholders per se. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I just looked at, I mean, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm cheating here. Um, <laughs> so, so can ask at BMI, PRS, they're all non-for-profit. So you extrapolate that to, you know, the wider right. range of societies. I'm going to guess most of them are going to be non-for-profit. I did come across some, some that are for profit. Okay. Um, but I can't quite remember them. It might be something like Sound Reef might be like a company set up. Are there any that are governmentally owned, like that are, you know, government organizations? 
Do you know what? Maybe in smaller countries yeah. um, that there may be um, almost like a joint sort of copyright office. Um, but but I, I, I don't know what government would want to... Um, <laughs> would want right. to get into that sort right. Of thing. right right um perhaps in smaller countries like may- maybe somewhere in latin america or something sure. but, but or or you know the sort of those not, not latin that latin america is a small territory it's a huge territory for publishing but certainly like smaller countries that don't have as uh, an advanced sort of infrastructure set up um there might be joint forces or maybe just government backed or something like that yeah yeah let's Let's talk about you for a second um, and what you do. How did you get into this role um, into to, to music publishing? Um, yeah, well, actually, I started out, so I, I always did music. Um, I, I'd say until the age of about 20, I sort of did performance and okay. composition and sort of I, I was on the other side. Um, and then I kind of really got into film music and TV mm-hmm. music and just writing to picture and then I kind of got really into um, the sync side of things. Um, okay. So, you know, commercial music, and I found it much more interesting analyzing, certainly for my dissertation and stuff like that, found it a lot more interesting analyzing music, commercial music that gets used. And that sort of brought me onto sync. And I didn't really know what the hell it was. Um, <laughs> I, I always knew publishing existed, but it was never something that I was sort of really taught sure um i'm sure we touched up on it in in at university because i did i did a bmas um at kingston so okay. shout out to them um, <laughs> <laughs> um but it wasn't something that you know i particularly knew much about but i knew i wanted to be in that sort of cross section between film and music and law was something i was toying with as mm. well and still am um, <laughs> And then I kind of landed into um, various jobs. Um, sort of, I, I did a ton of job interviews um, when I just left uni, which for anyone out there listening to this that is kind of struggling, oh my God, just keep doing it. It's, it's, I know it's soul destroying and I know it feels like, like with every rejection, you're just, you know, you're, you're never going to get there. But yeah. was that, chances are. Was that a way for you, you to find like, the place you really wanted to be at or help you hone in on what areas you were passionate about? I will say it was great research. So yeah. I yeah. There. <laughs> you can't, you can't. Um, oh, you're free here. Fantastic research because, you know, the jobs where I got to like second or third stages of interviews and, you know, with the majors, they do have like hugely long selection processes mm. and they get you to do lots of tasks and stuff like that. Like um, I think for Warner, I had to do like a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. Mm. Um, and then COVID hit. So, mm. oh. um, but um, yeah, so, so it's like, I, I took it all as sort of just general industry knowledge and I was applying to lots of different jobs. And I think actually, again, for, if anyone is listening out here that that is doing that thing right now, um, study like don't stop um Mm. i i didn't i know i didn't get the job that i have now and that sort of led me to this until i realized what it is i wanted to do specifically Mm. you know there's so many people that and, and it is good to be aware of all the sides of the industry but if you market yourself as sort of i do a bit of this and 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 a bit of that yeah yeah then then you're not really gonna, I mean, actually, I don't know, because I, I can't say this with utter confidence, because I do remember arguing with a sort of professional friend of mine who was sort of saying, well, actually, in his, from his perspective, it was completely different. It's totally the opposite. He needed to be, what he got to where he was, and I think he's a sort of producer now um, doing sort of big projects for um, library stuff, I mm. think, stuff like that. Um, and and he got to where he was by doing lots of different things. So, so sure. I don't know. So, so, so the, I'd say the paths vary, but certainly I feel like in my example for music publishing, it's the second I realized what it is I wanted to do. And I sort of set my mind on learning everything about that specific field, which is a big field. So yeah. it wasn't like I was limiting myself in any way. Um, it didn't feel like it. So, so 
the second I realized what I wanted to do, then it kind of got easier and it felt like I was getting somewhere. And um, I did a bunch of courses. So I, I went back and sort of short courses and I did more studying and I read books and it kind of led me to three tone um, in sort of weird ways. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm here and I'm setting stuff up. I, I'm a big fan of three tone. I, I do my digital distribution through the, the mm-hmm. music side and, and it's been amazing. It's, it's nice to have like a dedicated group of people that are real humans, at least from my experience. That oh, re- replied, that's a fantastic team yeah. over in distribution. Totally. What was it about music distri- uh, Sorry, music um, publishing in the in the end that that attracted you? Well, it's sort of like I said, it's that kind of perfect center between film, TV, that sort of product media, sure, yes. music, and and law. It's that perfect center, and you get to talk to artists and get the creative side, and you get to do the sort of contracts and admin side it's it's really diverse (laughs) and it may just be that i'm in the position where i'm kind of doing lots of different things so i might you know some people might have a different experience but for me it definitely feels like it's something that you know i i'm constantly learning i'm never bored (laughs) that's for sure yeah um and it's also great to be able to be in a to be in a position to give advice to writers who are coming in not knowing anything about the industry and then just sort of saying, okay, well, the, there's no right or wrong, but here is the con, pros and cons and here is a way that will get you to where you want to be. Um, here are the basic steps you need to take to ensure you're collecting and just gen- giving that general overview and educating is feels really good. <laughs> So many, let's talk about record labels for a second here for our Mm. audience. So many labels get confused about the publishing side of the business. Traditionally, are there any publishing responsibilities that a record label needs to be aware of? Um, Well, the only one that comes to mind straight off the top of my head is the sort of MCPS stuff. Okay. So um, record labels when they reproduce um, MCPS is the UK one. So I'm I'm talking about mechanicals here. Okay. So in order for a record label to be in a position to sort of print CDs and produce physical um, and sort of downloadable materials, Mm -hmm. um, they need to have a license essentially. Um, And they obtain that from the mechanical society of their country. And, um, they get a license specific to what they what it is they want to do. Um, in some cases, I have seen contracts where, um, particularly I think this is quite popular in America, where in the recording contracts, the label asks the artist to waive the mechanical right. or to knock off the mechanical fee. Now, my knowledge of this is I've never done it from the label side because we have, we release um, artists who are also on three-term publishing. So we we have an exclusion. We can get an MCPS exclusion because otherwise we'd be paying ourselves basically. Sure. Yeah, right. So 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 you can get you can apply for an exclusion if you have a publishing branch as well. Um, so you, we can print um, CDs from our sort of own roster. Um, and yeah. So this so, would be if a if a record label in America um, mm. has an artist on their label and they're releasing a vinyl or a CD and mm. they normally would, would owe a, a statutory rate per manufactured or per, per I don't know if it's per manufactured per, or per uh, sold. It's different. It, 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 you can choose. Okay. It depends okay. on, I think, yes. Yeah, so there's a choice of which one. Sure. Um, I think for smaller labels, it's, uh, the sale is okay. more. Right. And then for bigger labels, it, um, like for the majors, it's manufactured, so they pay based on how many records they produce, and then regardless of right. whether they sell or not, that they still have to pay the publisher a set. I think that's because uh, they they had some clever workarounds on on how to say that it never sold, but it did sell. Absolutely, yeah, yeah exactly. So so there's just then it's also you know it's I suppose it's more fair to be you don't want to be tracking down the usage of every CD sold by a major, by a, by a Sony or a Warner right. or a Universal. So it's easier to just get them to pay for what they're going to make. Um, and then, you know, so that's if an, pretty much it. if an artist doesn't have 
um, somebody looking after their publishing, then the these mechanicals they can in the contract with their new label they can opt to waive these. Just say it's okay; you don't need to pay me these. I, I think that's pretty yeah. common in in our with our listeners. Yeah, so I have seen that before. I personally have never kind of held that contract in my hands. And sure. there's something about it that doesn't feel like 100% right to me. Okay. But that might just be because I'm not familiar with it. So there are there will be like commercial reasons. But I will just say that if you are doing those deals, just make sure your artist knows what they are entitled to and what they might be missing out on. I yeah. think it's a nine cent that yeah, sort of I was I was gonna say like it, what is that like nine dollars per hundred records or something? I, I think so. It's either nine or yeah, no. No, I, I would have I would have I would have guessed nine. Gun to my head. That's mm. I mean, and that, it may have changed because I think it was it has been nine for quite a while. But and considering most CDs get sold for like ten dollars or something, you know, it's it's a it's a small it's a small relatively small royalty. Well, that's rate. it. Yeah, and and so I almost think. Instead of having that written into the contract, it's just probably easier to, to pay nine dollars. But I do know that, like, because it does create a little bit of a an accounting task, even if it's not the actual money yeah. that's allowed, that it's just more work for a small one person label. I think there is a lot of this, and again, I'm just speculating, but I know I've I've had this relationship with artists where it's like. I as a label, I'm, I'm doing a lot. I'm, I'm. This is maybe not even my full time gig. I'm just trying to help you release records. So, mm. in exchange for you know all that I'm doing for you, let's like forget about this silly, uh, arbitrary uh, mechanical fee. I, I have an understanding that that's what's kind of going on. Yeah, at, absolutely. At, at the very least, under so the many, table. And I think there's so many different m- models out there in the industry that you know the from the sort of massive labels to tiny labels there's so many different t- ways of running the companies that you know you, this is why those exclusions and contract provisions exist is to kind of cater to different setups so it's not necessarily a bad thing if you are doing it it's just you know just make sure you know what you i think for me it's always just make sure you understand what you're doing and make sure that everyone's in, involved and understands what's happening it's just about information rather than kind of yeah, because if you are doing it, you're doing it for a commercial or whatever other reason, so or convenience reason. So just make sure that that gets across to your artist, and there they have the full picture. Then that's great, and, and, and as always in in this business, transparency is the most important. What you know, even if if you're being transparent, and say I'm not paying you. <laughs> it's just <laughs> more important. Um, Absolutely, it is common, and we talk about this in the course. And you and I have been battling with this, and it's it's a huge co- a topic in in our Facebook group. But it is common amongst um, larger indies to want to get involved in the publishing of your artists if you are a record label. And we're starting to see that with medium size and smaller indies thinking about getting involved in the publishing. If mm-hmm. I wanted to start a publishing arm of my label, what is involved? Could 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 you walk us through? A, a, let's let's try for a ten thousand foot overview here, if possible. But yeah. um, you and I have talked about this at length, and th- there's just so much more involved than than the average label thinks. But uh, can you walk us through this a little bit? Uh, yes, I well, I can certainly try, and I think even in the course, I sort of result resulted to just having a checklist uh, right sort of that's summarized right that's right set of points rather than writing it or just saying <laughs> it out loud because it's just it there's so many steps yeah. and so first of all i would say if you don't understand what publishing is and you can't from the top of your head draw out a map of royalties generated who collects them where they come from who's entitled to them, I would say learn that first. So Great. Great literally a, a flow chart. If you can do it from your head, just sit down and do it, yeah. then, then you, you know, you've got that basic understanding of the setup. And I don't just mean for publishing, I mean for everything. So, so record uh, royalties owed to the record label, royalty, royalties ro- owed to the publisher, artist, composer, um, the difference between the two, you know, just if you can sit down and from the top, <laughs> that's a good exercise. It's great. It all out it's, yeah. And you understand it and you go online and you check it out and it looks good. 
perfect. Then yeah. you're somewhere, you know, then there's a good, you're in a good position position to start. So that's step one. Um, then there's the actual kind of elements of setting up a new company. Um, and it, it will vary from whichever territory you're in. Sure. I would recommend possibly, you know, setting up it as setting it up as a separate company, um, purely because it has that sort of separation then of the two. I talk a little bit about in the course about the kind of conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, in terms of kind of, um, sorry, um, conflict of interest in terms of uh, pressuring an artist into signing a deal just because they're a publishing deal, just because they're already with you on the label. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that, that, that is a big no go. And so, so if you put it to them that, you know, you'll get this one if you do the other one. And, and, um, and there's, yeah, no, that's a good, that is a really good point. And I, I'm trying to think back to the checklist that we we created, but there's also things like, I mean, registering with the the PRO and 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 then also something about software as well. Yeah, so so that's the actual physical process of registering, and that will vary from the kind of depending on the setup that you choose. So some people will go to that sort of halfway point and they'll set up as a company and they'll sign the contracts with their writers, but they don't want to do any of the admin stuff. They don't want to register any work. So they don't want to collect any sort of necessarily. They, well, they will still have to collect data, but they don't want to do that sort of registration side. So they'll get a bigger publisher to come in and do that for them. Right. Um, but, you know, it's about kind of finding the partnerships then. and just, or, or alternatively, you can do it yourself. And there's very a vast variety of tools available um most come at a cost so there is a free open source um software I kind of talked about in the course as well it's called um dmp um if you're unsure what that is just look it up um it's run by a guy called matia who we work closely with at three tone and mm. he um does a great little series of um, sort of publishing 101 and then it goes really deep into all that sort of CWR registrations and everything. So that's like a whole separate thing in itself. Um, so, so yeah. Um, and so, so that's the registration side. Yes. Yeah. And then, um, so like this whole process is, is pretty involved. It's not just as simple as saying, okay, we're going to handle the the publishing. And, and, and we've talked about before, it's it you know it should be as much work uh, as starting a record label like they're, they're absolutely I mean if if not more if not more yeah that's <laughs> um, right I, purely because you're catching up on knowledge that you didn't you might not have already had so 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 yeah I I think that's definitely a good gauge and and also financial kind of implications of bringing about setting up a new company also is something to keep in mind you will need a lawyer um, right definitely. If you're looking to start a publishing company without having legal advice, I, I I would strongly advise against that. I think it's going to be awfully hard, and you're you'd be setting yourself up for not a very successful business if you're sort of <laughs> agreeing to draft the contracts yourself. And and um, and you would need contract. Yeah, that's right. Because you would need contracts with the the songwriters, with the artists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And 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 you need your contracts to reflect what it is you're doing. So pulling a sort of a standard published contract from the web is it just doesn't work i mean you can i suppose in theory adjust your model to the contract that sure. you found <laughs> sure um it's a way of doing it but i would strongly advise against that <laughs> what about a what I, a, what about a company like song trust or or even administering with three tone what what goes mm -hmm. on there how does that process work um, so from the artist perspective or from the record label? Uh, I guess let's start with the artist perspective and then if there is any role that a record label would play in that. Yeah, so so with the artists, we have artists that come to us directly. Um, a lot of them are also on our distribution platform. So they opt in for a service. Um, they pay us a fee and um, we... Um, we, we look at all their data, we collect everything, um, we clean it up, we organize it, we get to, to the bottom of what they're, you know, few artists come into us from with having no kind of industry experience. Most right. of them have sure. been in business for a while and have 
like yourself, some works that are already kind of registered for some societies, but not others. And there's already sort of codes and IDs that are linked to. So it's sure. about kind of taking all that data, doing the research, consolidating all, it all into one. Um, and then we register our agreements and then we register any new works that you have. So you would send us um um, any new works that you've written and you want registered and then we check the data if there's anything missing we follow up on that um, and we register them and then sort of coming back down the chain we collect the royalties so we'll collect uh, royalties from all our sort of um, direct affiliations so different societies internationally and our sub-publishers will send us money as well um, and then we process that and we take a 15% commission Mm. And we pass on the rest of the royalties to you. We do not own any copyrights, um, which is going to be pretty much the same for every administrative company out there. Um, I'd say the biggest things that will vary between us is the sort of term length, although most will keep it to sort of a month or three months, uh, sometimes maybe a year um, on a rolling basis. Um Will they? None of us will own any copyrights, and the biggest differences will be sort of what's the commission versus the fee. So some companies like uh, Song Trust have a one hundred a uh, one hundred dollar commission, I believe, a uh, one hundred dollar registration fee, right? And then they have uh, they take something off the top on the commission as well. Um, I can't remember what it is now. With Three Tone, we have an eighty nine ninety nine pound. Um, fee setup fee which kind of it which the setup fee i actually think is justified purely based on the fact that um it's the initial it's a one-off fee so it's not a recurring fee yeah um so we we you know we put in work we get to know you we get to know your catalog most importantly we clean your data there's always going to be things there's very few artists that are going to come into me with 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 sort of clean ready made <laughs> yeah. spreadsheets right pretty much almost never i think you might be the closest one oh, <laughs> i think wow. your data was really good oh good <laughs> um so, so so yeah and but you're the only writer on your track so <laughs> true <laughs> that makes that always makes the job a lot easier so yeah. you know you build come into us with all the co-writers then i find out that the co-writers also have publishers uh who oh, yeah. registered the works with slightly different share splits and then i'm just like going back and what well what are the right share splits have you done splits agreements have you done this have you done that so there's that whole load of investigative kind of work per artist per writer so you know go figure so so hence the setup fee <laughs> that's right um and i like to call it the setup fee um because it's you know, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's what it takes to kind of get your full picture and make sure actually it almost works as an educational thing as well. So, um, because whenever we, I talk with writers, I always end up bombarding them with, with, with facts. I, I remember that. That was our first, our first zoom call. Yeah, it was. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, so what's the difference then with a, let's say this is artist specific I'm asking, but like a a traditional publishing company, if an artist were to sign a traditional publishing deal, they would be then signing away a portion of their copyrights. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, that will vary um, how much they want. So the only thing they will never be able to sign away um, is the writer's share. Um, unless you're talking, it, that is before we get into like all the kind of hypnosis stuff. I'm yep. sure you've heard. So that that model is different, right. but with a traditional publisher, you will be the, the it's the publisher's share that's to bargain for. So it's that fifty percent of performance income and one hundred percent of mechanical income. Right. Okay. Very cool. And what's the advantage then for an artist to to get a publishing? Not not that they're easy to get, but if a songwriter were to get a publishing deal, what would be the advantage of signing over, um, you know, a a portion of their copyright? as opposed to keeping it for themselves? Well, I'd say for many, it's um, there's an advance. So okay. an advance is seen as, as an investment into your career. You know, you can quit your day job and write for a living, yeah. which is, you know, always great. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a mark of success <laughs> to some. Right. Um, so, so, you know, so, so, so they get that kind of investment from the publisher to say, we think your music is going to go far, so we want to give you a, a, a publishing deal. 
Um, there's co-writing opportunities that many traditional publishers will offer as well. So they'll have a number of artists on their roster. Or, uh, sorry, I keep flipping between the terms. It's writers when we're talking about publishers. Mm. Um, a number of writers on their roster who they will kind of put together into little groups and they'll write music together. Obviously, the publisher will own the, the copyright on the music that they write. Um, in most cases anyway, but the point is that you're there sort of, you're, you're, you're then, I suppose, full time as a creative um, mm. songwriter. Sure. Um, so that's really good. Um, there's various opportunities that, um, you know, there's a lot more sync agencies that are operating on a non-exclusive basis. But if you're looking at sort of the majors like Sony and Warner and Universal, then, you know, they've got those connections. They don't, they still do, but they don't necessarily need to go out and find opportunities the opportunities most often come to them sure so there's that sort of again and the added advantage of having that sort of support of a big company um and yeah so i I suppose it's having that kind of thing of someone puts a lot of trust in you and i definitely wouldn't recommend signing off your publishing royalties for no advance right right (laughs) so i think a big but but also i would weigh up the advance against the percentage of uh royalties that they're asking for because um you know you need to recoup that advance and um the rate at which you recoup is um differs um and another important thing to note that in an exclusive songwriter agreement um which is what the traditional publishers usually sign um, and I call them traditional publishers. That's just an easier way. There's sure, lots of yeah. different, even between yeah. them, they vary. Yeah. Um, but in an exclusive songwriter agreement, you recoup from the you recoup the advance from the writer's share. Uh, from sorry, from the writer's share from the royalties paid to you. So um, let's say the agreement is for seventy five percent paid to the writer. Um, so. And you get an advance of ten thousand pounds or dollars. Um, you the, the the royalties that your publisher collects, the seventy five percent of that will go towards the recruitment of your advance, and twenty five percent will go to the publisher as right. Um, okay, that makes as, sense as their rate. So they're know? not so, they're not recouping you at a hundred percent right no. away. I see. Well, in, yep. in most cases, no. I, I, there's profit share agreements, but that's more common with record deals, not so much publishing. It's kind of like how you pay down a mortgage. Like some of it has to go to it's interest. Like interest. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> I, slightly uh, different, but yeah. I want to. I want to close up this conversation on, or sorry, close up the, the conversation on on record labels for a second. I I I think as we were talking about record labels who want to start a publishing arm or are thinking about starting a publishing company, I think there's this, and and we've talked about this at length. I think there's an opportunity for maturity and integrity for a small indie label to say, I don't have the resources or know-how right now to do right by my artist publishing or to Mm -hmm. justify taking any sort of cut. So maybe I'll just coach my artist to sign with an administrator or another publishing company. Um, Talk to me a little bit about that because we've talked about how important (laughs) it is for record labels to earn any sort of cut that they're taking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've summarized it pretty well there. So I would say that generally it's, um, uh, I kind of go through this in the course as well. So I'll be, I'm kind of going over myself, um, but, um, artists need to earn money (laughs) (laughs) and if they're, you know, it, 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 you as a record label are, should be invested in them earning money, even if you are not taking a cut, particularly for income revenue that you wouldn't t- traditionally be entitled to. So it's it can be very daunting to be, especially, and, and I'm this mostly applies to artists who also write their own material, so singer songwriter type vibes. Um, so you know, if if an artist comes and says um it, it, they're just going to sit and wait for a publishing deal um you know that could take years until they gain that sort of notoriety um it, it, i mean like if, to, mm-hmm. for them to be approached by a major yeah um so meanwhile they still are you know hopefully they're still working and performing and recording and releasing music and those royalties are there for them and 
while back claiming royalties is a possibility and it does happen, generally it can be quite difficult um, to sort of go back and track your usage and sort of shake down societies and radio stations and all of that sort of stuff for what, what they've played of yours. So an administrator from the very beginning, I say, is a really good deal for those up and coming artists um, because they will do they will lay the foundation for you. You know, they'll organize mm. your back catalog, but it's almost that <laughs> it's not back catalog yet, but it will be at some point. So right. the better that is organized, the the, the 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 more that's organized, the better. Um so again from the record label perspective, it's gonna be really handy um for you to know that they are getting this source of they are having the source of income um to be able to support them themselves. Uh, better and not have to do a day job or maybe do less hours at their day job just because they have those sort of income uh, sources right, true. additionally to recording additionally to the money that you will pay them for distribution or whatever whatever the deal is um so so yeah so it's it, i'd say it, it ultimately does benefit the record label but you do need to have that sort of artist first mentality that you know it, it's ultimately all about education and it's all about them you know, if you know this information and you know, you know, you have this information, tell it to your writers, tell it to your artists, make sure they are also informed because ultimately it'll build a much stronger um, relationship. And when, you know, when a major comes knocking on their door and says, oh, we want to steal you away, forget <laughs> about this other small time thing that you've got. And, the, and then the artist would can might perhaps say, well, actually, they've looked after me really well. And oh, my yeah. Up, yeah, totally. And I, you know, they've not overstepped their mark. They've not ripped me off. They've not sort of done any shady stuff. They've, <laughs> they've been with me all the way and, you know, go away. I'm going to stay with them. <laughs> That's <laughs> um, true. It might happen. And, and you see more and more um, uh, established songwriters switching sort of going away from those major deals and they're going towards the administrative side anyway so that's true yeah. why not start there you know yeah. um this has been great it, this is there's so much to cover we've just scratched the surface um <laughs> I, I i was reading a couple of months ago the a guide to music publishing by randall wixon oh yeah, a, yeah. and uh, it's such a great book it's actually really easy to understand but yeah, it was, it's a good little introduction. It I'd is. Say. But for me, it was also just enough for me to say, okay, I don't get this and I don't want any part of it. <laughs> That's why yep. I'm, I'm so thankful for people like you. Um, I want to ask you a couple other things for our um, exclusive for our patrons. So um, mm -hmm. stick around. But thank you so much for doing this. It's been so informative and so helpful to chat with you. You're very welcome. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Go to 3tonemusic.com. This is where you can find out more about 3tone music, 3tone publishing, and the work that Paulina does there. I um, do my personal publishing um, through them, and it's just really nice to have um, someone with a great accent to handle all of my catalogs. So please go to 3tonemusic.com to check them out. And remember, our micro courses just launched now. We have three courses. You can get them in a bundle or you can buy them individually, including this course with Paulina, Music Publishing for Record Labels. Go to otherrecordlabels.com slash courses to learn more. And thanks for listening.